Well, let me move on to you know, Donald Trump. Mark Meadows, as I, you point out, is, as we just pointed out, rather, is not commenting. Uh, to your knowledge, you are still involved in the campaign up through the election night, really, mm -hmm. and then into December. Did he encourage the president's extensive efforts to not concede and begin the process of trying to... I don't know the answer oh, to that question. Overturn the election. I don't know the question and the answer because really, after I denounced Donald Trump on ABC on election night. You know, we all saw that. Right. When, after I did that, I was not involved in any of those meetings anymore. Um, so I don't have any firsthand knowledge to that. But what I will say in watching that video is that looks to me like somebody who's cooperating with the federal government. You know, witnesses, grand jury is secretive for the government. The government cannot reveal things. But not for the witness. But not for the witness. The witness and the witness is told as they leave, you don't have to answer any questions or talk about it, but you are free to do so if you like. The only time you can't do it is when the government has a cooperation agreement with you and they say, no talking about this. The only time we want to hear you talking is when you're on the witness stand. And that, to me, Mark Meadows looks to me like a federal witness under a cooperation agreement. And I, my guess is that's what we're going to find out he is. You've said that when he refused to concede on election night, that was what crossed the line. What took you so long? There were plenty of examples of him suggesting prior to election day that the election was going to be a fraud, that he didn't believe it. He, he sowed doubts with people. Why did it take you so long to part ways? Look, I, I think that, that I always viewed that as part of him trying to encourage his voters and push his voters to come out in even greater numbers because he was trying to say, well, they're going to play games with it because we did have a very unusual election in 2020 with the, the, the absentee ballot issue being much bigger than it normally was. The difference for me, Andrea, was when you stand behind the seal of the president of the United States in the East Room of the White House on election night as president, and you say, this election was stolen, when you have absolutely no evidence to support that it was, you are, the American people are sitting there and thinking, well, he's president. He must know something we don't know. It lends credence to it that it did not deserve or merit. And I think that was so beneath the office. It was because the politics were over. The votes were in. So it's not playing a political game anymore, which we see lots of people do different things politically over our lifetimes. This is now, you're the President of the United States in the White House, in your official role, and you tell people it was stolen and it wasn't, and it undercuts their confidence in the election. And to me, that was the thing that was so unacceptable, so beneath the office that he was honored to hold, that I could no longer be supportive of him. Now you called him in December of 2020. Uh, to part ways and did you tell him you know you lost and what did he say to you um, well the intent of the call was not to part ways um, he had called me actually because he was upset about something I had said on ABC that Sunday um, and we got into the conversation and I said to him look I've known you for a long time what you need to do here is to concede the election to Joe Biden invite him to the White House shake his hand let the transition move forward, go to his inauguration, and then go back to Mar-a-Lago. And I said to him, look, I think Biden is not going to do well. And when he doesn't do well, if you do all this, you have a chance to run again if you want to. I said, but if you don't do this stuff, your career is over because no one will be able to trust you again for anything. And what did he say to you? I will never, ever, ever do that. So what else you got, Chris? So he said he would never concede. Correct. Did he say that he knew he had lost? He did not say that to me in that phone call. But what I will say to Andrew is that I know he was concerned about losing. When we were doing debate prep through the late summer and early fall of 2020, there were any number of times that he expressed that he was worried about the shape that the race was in, um, particularly in the context of the debate. He said, look, we got to work hard on this because I got to do well in this first debate. We need to catch up. So there was no question in my mind that he knew he was behind and he was concerned about it, but we didn't have any conversation post-election about that. Rudy Giuliani is now admitting in court that he made false statements about two Georgia women, two election workers, uh, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman. And, you know, that, of course, they were demeaned you know, vilified by Donald Trump, the followers, and it really changed their lives. Let's play what they said to the January 6th committee. 
have lost my sense of security, all because a group of people starting with number 45 and his ally, Rudy Giuliani, decided to scapegoat me and my daughter, Shay, to push their own lies about how the presidential election was stolen. I just don't do nothing anymore. I don't want to go anywhere. I second guess everything that I do. Um, it's affecting my life in a, in a major way. As a former prosecutor and a former governor, what was your reaction when you heard the audio of Donald Trump telling Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, just find me 11,780 votes? I thought it was awful. Uh, I thought it was beneath the office that he was honored to hold. And I thought that he was getting himself deeper and deeper into potential trouble. Uh, and it was because he couldn't, his own ego couldn't bear the idea that he had lost to Joe Biden. And he was going to do anything he could to convince himself first, and then anybody else that he could, that in fact he hadn't lost. But all the evidence was, was otherwise. And when I heard it, you know, I, I have to say the truth, I didn't at first think about it from a criminal perspective. I thought about it from a public perspective, and that it was, again, another awful moment that he was subjecting the American public to uh, because of his own ego. And that's just not the kind of person we need behind the desk in the Oval Office, in my view. And that's why I think it's one of the issues that disqualifies him. Donald Trump is attacking you on social media for shaking hands with Barack Obama mm -hmm. during the recovery from Superstorm Sandy. Um, what's your reaction to that? Well, we, we actually have responded to that as a campaign already, Andrea. Um, you know, I, I have said many times that I do not regret for one minute that handshake or the visit the president made that day because my state had sustained the worst natural disaster in its history and the second worst in American history behind Katrina. And the president came that day in the midst of a, the last seven days of a re-election campaign to come and see the damage for himself and to console the people of my state and to assure them that he was going to be there to help provide the funds that were necessary to rebuild and for our state to recover. That's what a responsible elected official does. And I'm confident Donald Trump doesn't understand that because all he would have been concerned about was that picture. I don't give a damn about that picture. I didn't vote for Barack Obama in 20, 2008 or 2012. I didn't support a great deal of his policies. But you have one president at a time. And he was good enough to come that day to support our state and to help us begin the rebuilding. And I don't regret for one minute welcoming him to my state. But what we did today was to send out a picture from Donald Trump's wedding in 2005 to Melania, where he's standing next to Hillary Clinton, who he invited to the wedding. So I'll say this to you, Donald. I invited Barack Obama to come and help my state after the worst natural disaster. I didn't invite Hillary Clinton to my wedding or Barack Obama to my wedding, and you did. So I don't know who was starstruck more, me or you, but given that you had donated $100,000 to the Clinton Foundation and repeatedly donated to Hillary Clinton's campaigns, it seems to me that your greed was, was driving that. So you want to keep sending those pictures out? It's fine by me. We're more than happy to respond with pictures of you, not serving your people, but serving yourself like you always do. That seems like a preview of a debate stage, except he's not going to show up, most likely. Uh, oh, he'll be there. You think? Oh, yes. Back in 2020, there was a briefing at the White House for the president about election security. Chris Krebs and others telling him that the voting machines were great. And apparently, according to reporting, he was ready to brag about that and have a news conference. So was he at one point pretty confident that the election could be done with mail-in ballots? I have to say the truth. From the time I started, um, debate prep with him, which was in the late summer of 2020, he was expressing concerns about mail-in ballots right from that moment. Right from that moment. And in fact, Andrea, you know, folks like myself and Bill Steppi and his campaign manager were urging him to stop because so many of, we thought, his potential voters were seniors who would be really concerned about going to a polling place during COVID um, and might not vote if they thought that mail-in ballots weren't secure that we were urging him to stop saying that stuff because we didn't think it was in his political interest to say so. 
Um, but I do remember him from the beginning. I don't remember hearing about him being proud of the security of the election. I have no reason to doubt the reporting, but he never said that directly to me.